What percentage of the population has issues with mental health that can get in the way of their day-to-day functioning? 100%. 100%. We all have mental health. We don't all have um, severe mental health issues. We are not all clinically diagnosed as something, but there are times where I have an ADHD moment and I'm not diagnosed with ADHD. There are times where I am feeling more anxious than others. There are times where I'm a bit obsessive about, oh my gosh, did I turn the stove off? I wouldn't classify those as like clinically treatable issues, but certainly that is a mental health issue if we're talking about symptoms. I am 24 years old. I am 21. I'm 29 years old. I'm 24 years old. I'm 36 years old. I am currently single. I am a divorced single mom of two little boys. I've been in a relationship going on two years. I'm currently not in a relationship. I'm single. I am in a relationship. I am married. I'm in an interracial marriage. And I have ADHD. And I deal with anxiety and depression. And I am bipolar with borderline personality disorder. The body does more for you been battling since a young girl being a sexual assault survivor i have borderline personality disorder and i have major depressive disorder i have bipolar 2 disorder ptsd i have postpartum anxiety i have diagnosed ocd and panic disorder and i am diagnosed with adhd and dysthymia the last time that i saw you first of all your first youtube video 2017 yeah, maybe you came 16, to my apartment, 17. you taught me how to take sexy photos yes. of my ass, which I don't have one, but you taught me how to create one with the pose. A lot has happened since then. A lot for both of us. Well, I want to hear about you. <laughs> okay. What's happened to you since then? What's been your experiences? Oh my goodness. I think I met you, yeah, right around the time where I knew I wanted to go into sex education, sexology. I went and did that similar or the same exact program that you did with the Institute of Advanced Study of Human Sexuality. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And yeah, I was just kind of strutting down the path of sexuality and things were starting to take off for me as they have been for you. And I'm so proud of the work you've been doing. I I really mean that. I really do feel that. (laughs) And you know what? My life kind of, I had a website and then it was like, yeah, Instagram's blowing up. And then I'm doing a podcast. I had a clothing line doing events. I'm sure you're familiar, but with all that, and it was just a lot on me mentally. And I kind of, had to take a step away from work and my career to go focus on my mental health. I was just literally losing my mind. I was very suicidal. I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. Like I really just wasn't functioning. So I knew like no career is worth this. I mean, I'm not going to have a career tomorrow if I'm not going to be around tomorrow. So I decided to take a step back and I took time off of work. I entered a outpatient program at Columbia um, in New York City. And I went to therapy literally like in outpatient five days a week, group therapy for four hours a day. Had you never gone to therapy prior to that? I had gone to therapy. I actually had a therapist during this time and I felt like it wasn't helping me. Like I wasn't really able to manage the anxiety or the stress public speaking was really hard on me and I was touring and speaking at high schools and colleges and speaking at Columbia and I spoke at Brown and doing all of these things that I knew I, I loved doing, but at the same time I was so nervous or so scared and had a lot of like imposter syndrome. I felt like I was struggling with why me, why is this my life? there's other people who deserve the success more than me. Like it was really hard on my self-esteem and I just knew I needed to take a moment and reevaluate my life and what I wanted. And so that's what I did. What was your diagnosis when you went to the outpatient center? I have borderline personality disorder. It's a technically a personality disorder, but it's like nine criteria and criteria in the DSM and it's like fears of abandonment it's 
like impulsive behavior. So that can be sexual, that can be gambling, um, a lot of suicidal ideation, really high rates of people with borderline personality actually attempt or commit suicide. And it's it's funny because the more and more I talk about this online and I'm really trying to open up the dialogue around mental health, I meet other people who are like, oh, wow, my partner doesn't know I have a personality disorder. My partner doesn't know I've tried to commit suicide before. And it really speaks to intimacy and building a bond with someone. They need to know who you are, you know, for you to be able to give and receive love. Well, the problem is that people, because they maybe are high functioning, they think it's a part of themselves they have to tuck away and keep a secret. Oh, I mean, that was me for many years, years and years and years. Um, yeah, I always felt like I had a mask on, literally. Like, yeah, I couldn't show, I didn't want to show anyone the crazy sides of me. Um, because you have a lot of these reinforced ideas of, oh, if I show them these things that I struggle with, they're going to leave me or they're I'm unlovable. They're not going to love me. And so that was something I really worked on during my five months away and something I really had to come around of my doctor would always tell me, my therapist, you're not crazy. You have mental illness like you're you're sick and you have to look at it like a physical illness. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't understand. And unfortunately, I've been exposed and come from a family who they're not really familiar understanding of mental health issues. There is so much stigma around mental health that it's not real, that people who have depression are lazy that people who are anxious are just high strung. And if you got off your phone a little bit, like you wouldn't have these problems. And I'm like, how many times do these studies have to come out <laughs> that it's like, it's fucking brain chemistry. You want to put me through a CAT scan? You can look at my brain. It will look different than like an average healthy person. Your point about making the comparison to physical, we understand that physically certain people are not able to do certain things. Yes. Like, I cannot dunk a basketball. It doesn't matter how much I want to do it or how much I will myself or how much research I do. It just more than likely is not feasible for my body type. And accepting the same thing that for you mentally, based on what you are born with, it more than likely, these things that seem like, well, just do it or just feel it, just accomplish it. You just can't. Exactly. And I think I put pressure on myself because of some of my values or views of like, you know, I don't want to have a partner who cheats on me. I wouldn't stay with them. I wouldn't tell my girlfriends to stay with their boyfriend. Yet I'm so freaking out of them abandoning me or going through a breakup that I will stay in this relationship that I know isn't working for me. Mm -hmm. How freeing is it to get the diagnosis to know like so freeing because like you the biggest you weight off my shoulders. It was so freeing. I mean, yeah, at the same time, though, I don't want to be defined by my diagnosis, you know, so that's a fine line. And actually, it is very treatable, which is awesome. Well, let's talk about bringing your mental health illness into the bedroom into the bedroom and into a relationship yeah a lot of people want to leave it outside i had this conversation with somebody about god actually in, uh, interestingly enough that they felt like in order to have sex they had to leave god outside of the bedroom okay. which it's a big part of their life their religious beliefs but so it never sex never really felt complete and full because a massive part of them was always waiting outside so they started to invite god into the bedroom sex just got so much better better yeah so I'm wondering if you relate to that. No, I definitely relate to that. Um, yeah, I think there was a lot of fear of, oh, man, I don't want to appear a certain way. I hope this relationship doesn't get to the point where I start acting crazy and then they leave me. So, yeah, always putting on a facade. I think I had a real fear of intimacy. So I had pushed people away or I've been in relationships where I've cheated on partners because I was afraid of that intimacy, like almost self-sabotage. <laughs> And so now with everything that I know and and also not wanting to continue that spiral or the way my life was going, yeah, I have these conversations with my partners. 
I mean, my boyfriend that I'm with currently, I told him, I was like, I struggle with borderline personality disorder. And that was, that was the first time I had ever told a How'd current you partner that. Where did you bring it up? Tell me, set the scene for me. Oh, I'm not even trying to remember because I feel like it was so casual. That's amazing. Like <laughs> It wasn't like a like, sit down have your favorite meal like it's just something that rolled off the tongue yeah and I think also I was looking for a different type of partner after I got out of the hospital I wanted someone that I could communicate with I didn't want to play games or yet try to seduce someone like I came out of there being so much more comfortable with who I am that I wanted a partner who saw all of me and can accept me for who I am do I still have issues with my boyfriend? Yeah, all the fucking time. And I mean, relationships are hard and you have to work at them. And especially when you're bringing in like a literal personality disorder. But yeah, I think I just told him, hey, I have specific needs in this relationship that such as I will go a little Lulu if my partner is like liking other girls' photos on Instagram and that's just something that makes me feel insecure and then it will aggravate some of these vulnerabilities or behaviors. And when I'm really stressed out, then I can kind of see manic and I don't ever want to get there again. Yeah, I just felt like he was so receptive and that's when I knew like, wow, I found such a genuine good guy and I want to be with this person because I had been with partners in the past who I – I didn't know why I felt that way, but I had brought up similar things. Hey, when you're liking other girls' photos or if you're texting other girls, it makes me feel incredibly insecure, which I think is actually kind of normal. Mm. But specifically with my vulnerabilities, it makes me feel really out of control and kind of crazy. And I've had ex-boyfriends be like, well, why do you care so much? So why are you, lo why are you st looking at whose photos I'm liking? or you're being so dramatic. And so I had gotten a lot of that pushback in past relationships, which makes you kind of scared to even bring this stuff up. Yes, because it's really just laying out, here is how I can enjoy being with you. And when I'm in enjoyment being with you, I have the highest chance of one, looking after your needs, and two, you feeling fulfillment being with me as well. Oh, 100%. If I feel comfortable, then I feel like sexy and I want to have fun and I want to get freaky or like do all these things. But bottom line, I need to feel comfortable. Hi, Nedra Glover Tawab, author of Set Boundaries and Find Peace. And just overall, everybody's favorite online therapist. Now, I'm trying to think through the process because if I, for example, identify as somebody who is depressed and I find somebody who I feel like I have a good connection with and there's a sense of trust there, and then I tell this person that I have this personality disorder or I've got an issue and they accept me, how do I then go to that person who I feel like has already taken on a lot and say, okay, now can we also go to therapy together to ensure that we keep a good thing going? don't buy into be to the belief that you're too much because what i what when you were saying that it sounds like i'm all of this and someone has to take me we're all too much we're we come with our own stuff we have our own stories we have our own preferences we all have a lot going on so what I have going on is not bigger than what another person may have going on. So not assuming that this is going to be a deal breaker in a relationship. It is a healthy thing. People without mental health issues may want to proactively go to couples counseling. So it's not a thing that you're asking someone to do out of nowhere. I think if you want to be in a healthy relationship, it might make sense at some point just to go to counseling. It might make sense at some point to read a few books about relationships, whether there is a mental health issue present or not. How do you unsubscribe from the belief that you are too much, that you're that we almost have to essentially dole ourselves out in select doses because all at one time it's just way too overwhelming for for folks with mental diagnosable mental health issues. And I'm making that distinction because I think we all have mental health issues. Um, we have to normalize having mental health issues. We have to normalize using mental health language. We have to normalize discussing, naming, 
talking about feelings. If we did that more, we would feel less isolated. If we did that more, we will understand that everybody experiences so many of these things. You do not have to have a diagnosis to have two sleepless nights because you're worried about something. That happens to humans. And so when someone shares that, you can understand it because you're a human. Um, there are so many things that we experience, we just don't talk about those things. And that is the bigger problem. It's not that there is this you know, mental health thing that's happening is that there's this secrecy around mental health because everyone has it. And I wonder if, you know, the people who were brave enough to go to therapy and say, hey, I'm having this issue a little more than other folks, or at least I think I am, if they just happen to be a little more willing to talk about it than the general population. But talking about it certainly takes the sting out of it because I, I'm sure if we, you know, talk for an hour, we have a lot of things in common as humans that we have felt that someone might say, oh, that's a mental health issue. Well, that's to me a human experience. That's a, that's mm -hmm. a feeling. That's, that's what happens when someone dies. We, you know, that's how we respond to, to certain things. This is just being a human. We talked about in the interview, bringing your mental health positive the heavy the still uncharted and um the parts maybe that you're that you struggle with but bringing all of that into the bedroom and uh, i mean during sex when you're trying to integrate that part of yourself into your sex life is there a separate conversation that has to be had around boundaries and triggers if you know what your triggers are there are times where particularly with sexual health issues, I've seen people try to pretend that they don't have any. This is the first time this has ever happened, okay? It would be better if you could just be honest that you're having an issue with arousal or an issue with performance. It makes sense to talk about that and not to pretend that there is no issue present and to talk through, again, strategies because vulnerability increases um, sexual experiences. You know, it's a huge reason why, why women can orgasm, right? When you are mm -hmm. comfortable with a partner because you trust them, you've been vulnerable, you have a higher likelihood of actually having a pleasing experience. So it makes sense to talk through these things. And if the thing is impacted by mental health, that can actually change the sexual health issue. I love this. And I think that you have just shared so many gems in this conversation. And I want to close out just by the person who's listening to this right now, who maybe hasn't got a, gotten a diagnosis, but knows that they do have particular triggers and those triggers lead them to feel out of control um, over their mental health. And they're wondering if this is a barrier for intimacy for them. So I wanna talk about strategy because that's a word that you use so beautifully. If you were to give that person a strategy to coming to terms with and then being able to share this knowledge about themselves with somebody else, what's a common you know, couple steps you could offer? I would say, think of the words you want to use and don't focus on finding the perfect words. Oftentimes we don't say anything because we are looking for the perfect thing to say this does not exist. There is no perfect way to say that I am anxious and sometimes that impacts my ability to perform in the bedroom. Now, of course, timing matters, but this is an issue that many adults commonly deal with. And I think the challenge is that it's not talked about. And again, you think it's you and perhaps not this situation. No one is taking ownership. So really own it, own it and talk to your partner about the issues that you're having. Um, talk to them about triggers and strategies that you've used in the past that might work and explore some strategies that could work now. I think, you know, sex is really about exploration and figuring out what could or could not work. So this is a wonderful opportunity to explore. And the million dollar question of when, mm. when is a good time to start these conversations? I'm often surprised at how often we have sex without talking about having sex. 
And then we have all of these people who say, oh my gosh, the, our sex life is terrible. Have you ever talked about sex? No. <laughs> well, uh, just like you would tell a waiter or waitress how to prepare your burger, you have to tell people what is pleasing and not pleasing to you. And typically you do that before somebody brings the burger out. You don't wait until you have the burger to say, oh, you know what? I didn't want onions. <laughs> you say it before you talk to people about these things before we can talk about everything under the sun salary where we want to retire how many kids we want to have but there is something about talking about sex before having sex that many people are like oh my gosh i can't be honest i have to make up these stories or play into a fantasy and it's like hey tell the truth so both of you can have a wonderful experience. And I think by being honest, it takes some of the pressure out of the situation. It can decrease the anxiety. Lovers and friends, lovers and friends. I'ma take you on a trip, baby. I don't pretend. I say, lovers and friends. Uh, I'ma hold you down, down to the end. I say, lovers and 